So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lanny Blackman, and I'm really grateful all of you are here today. Um, I I think that the the urgency around um, ending gender oppression and making gender inclusive classrooms is sort of a welcome distraction right now for me. Um, and so I'm really glad to take this time with you and to get to work on preparing things. I really love how already <clears throat> people are connecting and sharing in the chat and I'm gonna encourage that kind of participation today. Um, there's a lot of people who inspire me to do this work. Um, friends, family members, um, former students, future students. Um, and so I, I'm glad to see that we have that connection too. Um, I use the pronouns she and her to refer to myself. And I see, I, I loved how some people started that um, modeling that practice for us of putting pronouns next to their names in the chat um, and on renaming yourself on the participant list. If you are comfortable sharing your pronouns, you can do it that way um, by hitting rename next to your name. Uh, and what I wanted to tell you a little bit just quickly about myself. I am the um, librarian at Fort River Elementary School in Amherst. I am also um, the Amherst Pelham Education Association's Unit A co-chair for elementary. Um, so I sit on the executive board of that. And before I got into education and school librarianship, I did, um, I worked in the professional nonprofit world of social justice, racial justice, um, reproductive justice, gender justice, um, uh, non-profiting. So um, I'm glad to bridge worlds um, and lives here with you all. So um, <laughs> I started us off with this video or the song Salt and Peppa, um, Let's Talk About Sex, just to confuse us all because actually we are not here to talk about sex. We're here to talk about gender. Um, and in this um, short but long, who knows, but um, this hour and a half together, um, I hope to give you an introduction to understanding gender diversity and really what is gender. Um, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this and I'll actually like make you do that work together in small groups. We all need this wherever we're at. Um, I learn new things about gender all the time. Um, and thinking about it, explaining it to ourselves, to our um, colleagues, um, helps us get a better grip. Um, but that introduction is one of the focuses. I really want to sort of give you a preview and um, access to some frameworks of thinking and resources to have these conversations in your school communities to change your practices, to help influence um, the practices in your school communities. So it's going to be a lot, um, but I do wanna say, let's not talk about sex. Um, we'll talk a little bit about biological sex and how that relates to gender and other social constructions. Um, We'll talk a little bit about sexuality and how that relates to gender um, as another social construction. Um, but so we're exploring the relationship of these things in order to focus on and understand when we're talking about gender, what are we talking about? Um, and just a quick note, other um, words that have the word sex in it, um, sexism, is um, incredibly destructive, but it's also not the focus of this, of our hour and a half together. Um, sexism is different than gender oppression. Um, it's treated different legally, and we'll talk about that more. So here we go, let's talk about gender. Um, I also um, want to tell you that um, don't worry, I'll provide you lots of resources. You may have already seen um, some of that in the workbook, if you've already worked, um, done the workbook, 
Um, I see your chat, Deborah, and I hope we um, connect about this. I want to know more. Um, uh, linked in the workbook are a lot of resources, but we'll get into all of that. So, um, just a couple quick notes about how we are here together. Um, you're welcome to keep your video on. When that keeps you engaged, if you're talking um, as a way to connect with other people, at the same time, you're welcome to keep your video off if that's what keeps you engaged um, and if it helps you to connect and speak. And we'll all make room for whatever that is for each of us. Um, let me tell you, you probably know already, but middle schoolers love to keep their videos off. Um, and I see lots of people already good at this. Um, use the chat. Um, I'll have prompts that I encourage you to sort of uh, talk with me and each other about throughout this time together. Um, because there's so many of us, we won't have as much opportunity to, um, in this group of 54, um, use our voices. But that's a way that I do encourage. And um, actually, Dan, you're the one that inspired number four here. Um, just a note about distractions. I am that person who's like, oh, I'll just open my email tab and I'll pay attention while I'm doing this and then I'm not paying attention. So I encourage you not to open your email tab. Um, but if you are a person who, um, who likes to be multitasking um, in the workbook, there's a, the resource list is an engaging way to um, connect to our topic, but multitask. So we'll see that. Um, an hour and a half is so short. I do encourage you to ask questions. Dan's going to help me kind of like uh, make sure I don't miss anything in the chat as we're going along. Um, you're welcome to also unmute and interrupt me. I'm pretty good at being interrupted. Um, and it's, I hope to provide you with um, enough that you can make connections, form your own action ideas, um, and identify resources here that you can use in your context. And so I hope you're thinking, if you're a writing person, um, do the writing. Um, if you are a typing person, um, open the workbook. Actually, um, well, just one second. Um, so, the other piece that I specifically um, have, the job I have for you is to really think about language that I use that's presented um, in this presentation and how you can um, further your learning beyond this presentation by getting more comfortable, more um, understandings, broader understandings of the words and the language that we can use to create um, an inclusive school community for everyone's gender. Um, so think about what's resonating with you, what's making you uncomfortable, um, why, and so you um, can sort of notes take on that and focus some of your notes taking in that way. So if you will please open the workbook right now, even if you're not a multitasking person, um, Dan has provided the link there in the chat um, and you should have a view only copy. Um, and that means that you will go to the file button and you will make a copy. Now in the event you're not a Google Docs user, you can also download it. I can't promise the formatting will look good, um, but those are your two options because this is a live document for you to use, your handouts to take away, um, your reference for when we do breakouts and so you know what you should be doing. Um, so make sure you have your copy open. Um, in this, there's, let's see, is there anything, oh, oh no, did I do the wrong thing? Okay. Um, I think that I covered what I wanted to cover. Um, and yes, yeah, Sherry, we can resend that link. Um, yes, so. Uh, make sure you have yours open. If you haven't, if you're having trouble with that, feel free to um, chat and I'm 
put Dan on the spot to help out with that. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that um, you can use to engage but distract yourself is um, the Celebrate Gender Active Resource List. And that's a takeaway for everyone today. Um, if you wanna start engaging with that throughout the presentation, that's fine too. Um, but the way this is set up currently is, again, you'll make a copy for yourself so that you can notes take and um, make it your own. Um, and there's currently over 33 different resources on this list. Um, in, they're meant to do lots of different things, connect you with organizations that are doing curriculum building, um, connect you with expanded history, um, uh, sort of like popular media sources, different like facts, different um, trans student organizations that are making um, information available. So really to expand all of our ideas of what gender inclusion can look like. So feel free to engage with that. Um, but right now, please in your workbook, go to the language tool. It's on page two. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a tool for you to use now and to scaffold your thinking in the future. We'll come back here a few times. Um, so on language, I've already started using language that many people are probably familiar with and other people are un unfamiliar with. Some things might make people feel uncomfortable right now. Um, but language keeps changing and evolving. And at no point am I going to um, put up a definitions list because I find them too static. That being said, there are some definitions lists in the resources. Um, but when language changes and evolves, it's often for the better and we can be part of that process. Um, so this is a concrete example of how this presentation is not gonna offer you a one size fits all. You're not gonna leave here and be able to, you know, stamp something on your school community. Um, your community is different than mine. Your students are different than my students. Um, we all have to change with it, particularly with language um, and push it towards positive change. So that's what I see as part of our work here together. It's hard that I gave you a blank sheet instead of a definition list. Thanks for um, pushing through. Um, so what this tool is meant to do is allow you a place to jot down language words or phrases that seem important. You don't need to qualify the importance. You can just stick them in the words list for now. Or if you have an immediate reaction that it resonates with you, that it makes you uncomfortable, um, you know you need to learn more. You can put them in those different boxes or you can do that later. Um, this is your live document so things can move and shift. Um, while we're together and when we are apart. Um, you can also put in links here that for things that you see as useful to really digging into this language work. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? All right, three minutes ahead. We're doing great, everyone. So this is um, a little manifesto for our work here together today. Um, this is our starting place. It's a non-negotiable. Um, if you're not with me in this statement right now, that's totally okay. Um, but I don't see this as a place to debate it. Um, this is our collective jumping off point. So if you're not sure, just like fake it till you make it, let's do it. Um, this is a place to challenge your own thinking by asking yourself if your questions, thoughts, action items are founded on this statement. This is our our baseline, our checkpoint. Um, we'll explore this, we'll go deeper into this, we'll make connections that affirm this. In other times I would say, hit me up immediately and let's talk if you disagree. But honestly, if you email me um, in two hours and tell me I disagree with this statement, I probably won't be able to get back to you for six months and um, uh, then I'll forget. So wait a couple months before you email me um, if you want to like, strongly disagree and debate this. Um, 
Uh, but I do want to use this as a starting place to identify language that's useful to us. So I hope that you still have your workbook tab open and on, in your on page uh, two. Um, and let's think about this language. What is, what's resonating? We are here to celebrate gender. All of the genders that are in my community, mine being yours, and in the world, so that all of our students can learn here because of their gender identities. And so our students learn to be successful in a world full of gender diversity. This is our starting point. Um, so now that I've talked at you a little bit um, and given you, I don't know, a whirlwind of not understanding where we're going, but hopefully you're trusting the process. I want to give you ch a chance to talk to each other and to um, start to dig into where am I at with understanding what gender is and how can I use some tools to help me. Um, and we're going to ground that in our personal experiences because I'm going to bet every single one of you was a kid at some point. So um, this is this breakout space is called um, the activity I've developed um, celebrating my gender as a kid and using the gender unicorn to guide us. Um, in your workbook, you can um, click on the links in the table of contents to get to these items to use in your um, breakout groups. Um, I'm gonna put you in rooms hopefully of four, knock on wood, and in that, I invite you to introduce yourselves, um, your name, your pronouns, your school ro roles and locations, and then most importantly, designate a timekeeper. Um, someone maybe who has a phone handy with an easy timer on it. Um, then facilitate yourselves in just a silent reflection of looking at the material of the gender unicorn. And think about where you are right now um, on the gender unicorn. Um, where would you place yourself on all the dials and the spectrum and the arrows? Um, get familiarize yourself with this framework of understanding gender. Um, but think about it in terms of you. Um, so then the connection point, um, the talking points will be each of you um, giving each other two minutes to go around and share a memory or activity that you had enjoyed when you were young, and that is reflective of your gender identity today. Um, when you give each other two minutes, I really, really, really strongly encourage you not to interrupt, not to ask questions, not to make connections. Just give that space for um, each person to talk, and sometimes that means we sit in silence and that's okay too. I provided some sentence starters here, if that is a helpful tool for you. And then lastly, you can take your fi last five minutes together to discuss, to ask questions, to make connections, um, and think about what differences you have or where you're excited to go together. Um, so, I see a couple people on my screen, thumbs up, this sounds doable. So workbook, um, celebrating my gender as a kid and gender unicorn. And we're, you're gonna have 20 minutes. <clears throat> we're gonna look at the gender unicorn together as a group. And if you wanna put in the chat, what is useful about the gender unicorn? If you are really excited to say something, you can unmute yourself, um, but let's talk but not about sex. <laughs> An amazing tool. You can also, I you know, I'm an elementary school teacher, so like thumbs up, thumbs in the middle, two thumbs going in different directions. <laughs> um, I've been using it with middle school too. Thumbs are really useful. Um, 
Hmm. Okay, so closing the breakout, the breakout rooms are closed. I think we're all back, right, Dan? If it says 50 participants, I don't know. Yep. I think we're all back, awesome. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me a little bit. So um, for those who are just entering while I um, get my thoughts together, um, we're gonna look at the gender unicorn together um, as a large group. So um, lots of people have started putting in the chat what they, um, what they really got out of the gender unicorn. Um, I know I got to talk with two people who like, a, maybe it was four different people about how we really like unicorns in general. Um, but um, this visual of separation has been useful. That's great. Um, and really complicating what goes into sexuality. I saw people are finding that useful. Can use it with middle school health? Yes, definitely. I would encourage that. Um, so in terms of pulling out some of what you're talking about, keep talking in the chat here um, and making these connections. What is useful about the gender unicorn? Um, for me, um, I this is my current favorite of the different visuals and graphics that help us understand what goes into gender. Um, and the things that I focus on are thinking about how gender identity is different, but not, you can't necessarily separate it completely from biological sex, from gender experience expression, gender impression. I'll go into that a little bit. Um, but the bottom line is we've all got it, right? Even if we don't think about our gender identities, there's all these different things that um, influence how we know ourselves to be. And that's constantly changing. Um, gender is not sexuality. Um, and we really see that on the unicorn here, um, where sexuality has got some dotted lines. And, um, and is broken down into physical attraction and emotional attraction. Um, all of these things on the gender unicorn are socially or societally prescribed. They're all social constructions, um, which means we have the power to change them or I would say an even more power to change how um, they're perceived and treated, our identities are perceived and treated in the world. Um, and none of these things are fixed, they keep changing. So I wanna pull up the unicorn to be a little bit, um, so I can see it better, so we can all see it better. Um, so let me just, let's see, where did you go unicorn? Um, um, that work? No, that didn't work. Sorry for technical difficulties. Um, there you are. Okay, I can see it better. I hope you can. So the gender unicorn, um, is a graphic made by the trans student education education resource, uh, teaser, and, um, and there's lots of different um, graphics that help us understand um, what influences and, um, and comes into our thinking when we think about gender, and they've evolved over time. I would say probably now the gender unicorn is a little bit old. It's a few years old. I'm kind of old school here. Um, I hope you can bear with me. Um, but a lot of these kinds of graphics have, um, have they keep it, um, talking to each other and influencing each other and helping us like think um, bigger and make these connections. So one of the things of past graphics that, um, that were really limited is that they showed things like gender identity, gender expression, um, sexuality as one spectrum. Um, and what the gender unicorn forces us to do is see how our gender identities are 
really not binary and not a binary scale either, right? Like we have um, our experiences of um, masculinity and femininity at the same time. They're not um, one or the other. And so I really like that about the gender unicorn, really complicating that. One of the limits, the major, major limits of the gender unicorn, and I'm visually, I'm not sure how you would do this, is that it doesn't show how um, many of our other or all of our other social identities um, interact with our ideas of masculinity, um, with our ideas, our ideas of what it means to be a woman. Um, so race, class, um, ethnicity, nationality, language, all of these things interact and this visual pulls gender and sex um, and sexuality out of that mix and you really can't. Um, but um, one of the things that I think is interesting to me too about the gender unicorn is sex assigned at birth. There's three circles that you can check. Um, and this is true and real and untrue and not real <clears throat> in some ways. So it's true and real in that when you are born <clears throat> in the United States, generally a doctor or a midwife or whoever's filling out that birth certificate puts a check in a box that says female or male and in some cases <clears throat> designates people as intersex. Um, but they're not actually clear cut um, check boxes in that there aren't medical, there are some medical definitions for um, what makes a person intersex. Um, and a lot of times doctors scramble and kind of say, I don't know, um, is this person female? Is this person male? Is this person um, intersex? Because there's so many different biological things that go into define our biological sex. Um, and I'm not an expert on this, I'm not a scientist, um, but it has to do with our chromosomes, um, the ways that our chromosomes tell our bodies to create um, hormones. Um, it has to do with lots of different things. And while it's made to seem like it's check boxes, it really isn't. And these are also then social constructions of what biologically makes up female or male. And a lot of times doctors kind of throw up their hands and they're like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I just want to take a second to see how things are going on in the chat and see if I'm missing anything that you feel like is really useful about the gender unicorn. Oh, I know. Sorry. Um, I also wanted to say that our gender identity, um, as you can see on the um, the graphic here is about it's about me it's about who I know myself to be and so they have that like thought bubble with the um, rainbow in it you may mm, take from this graphic that I like unicorns and rainbows and things um, but there are things outside into the world that um, that come into play and that is the way I express my gender um, is about me and what I do with my body, how I wear myself, how my posture, um, all of these different things. But there's also the way that people, and this isn't illustrated on this graphic, it's the way that people read my expression. It's what you see when you see um, the shape of my glasses or um, the way that I hold myself and that, influences how you perceive my gender or how you, um, yeah, how you call me, maybe. Um, maybe then what you think about when I talk about my gender identity, because maybe it doesn't match with what you think about. So all of these things come into play. Yes, Jen, awesome. Jump in. I see your hand raised. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, my question is, um, I would love to use this um, as a tool in my, I teach kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if anyone has any experiences 
with using this poster or this um, graphic with um, children in early elementary school, even K through two or K through five. My experience with the unicorn, and um, I love unicorns, mm -hmm. um, but my experience with the unicorn this past year was I had a little boy who, um, his parents identified him as gender creative, and he would wear his sister's clothes to school. Um, and the it's in my experience what i see in kindergarten and kindergarten clothing in particular is where i see um my boys and please forgive me because i'm just learning all of this language but where i see the um, boys and girls expressing their gender identity is in the clothing that they wear Mm -hmm. And generally, I see, I don't know if I've seen any unicorns, truth be told, on typically marketed boys' clothing. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder if I were to present this, and um, this little guy would be made fun of for wearing unicorn clothes and rainbow clothes. And, or, you know, it was noticeable when he had a, a unicorn shirt on. Mm -hmm. um, and how this symbol um, of the unicorn, how it would be um, received by both boys and girls. Do you see what I'm? Do you um, see what I mean? Or does anyone have any experience with that? It being a non-issue. Um, I think some interesting points are how um, we've like socially prescribed um, gender to unicorns. <laughs> yeah. Real, like our students read that, like, you know, we'll say like, that's a girl thing, that's a boy yeah. thing. Um, but how, how can we expand that? And that's some of what I'm gonna go into, but specifically in this case, I would say um, there's a lot actually of picture books that I would say expand our idea of the gender appropriateness of unicorns or gender specificity of unicorns. Okay. Um, and so that might be helpful. And I would, I like, one of the points that I agree with you about is with um, kindergartners, um, something that's completely developmentally appropriate is really expanding and for, providing kindergartners with the tools to think about how they're putting each other in boxes. Um, because there's research that shows that like all these social prescriptions like get locked in at fear, right? Yeah. We're doing it already, but it's not that we're born with it, it's that we're doing it in the world around us. So how are we expanding that learning? And that is like um, the focus of we'll get we'll get there a little bit more. But I wanna let other people um, jump into some specific books, like um, Daisy Me is a great book for really showing lots of different gender expressions and then putting different pronouns on them um, and getting practice with that. So that's like one concrete idea. Um, did anyone else wanna, oh yes, Not Quite Narwhal, I think that that should be required reading in every place in the world, um, more or less. <laughs> um, Nancy, come jump on in. Um, I just wanted to say my uh, daughter and her wife, uh, my wife teaches in Waltham. My daughter is a teacher of, um, she's, she's got a license for um, pre-K through two. Mm -hmm. uh, their son, Theo, his favorite color is pink and he, was teased in kindergarten, but um, he has, because he has enlightened parents and they've done a lot of educating of the parents group, um, I think the people are getting more aware and there's a lot less teasing that happened in first grade. Plus he's also a dancer, which is not your usual. But then my other daughter is totally heterosexual and she, she will not let her little boy dress in colors that she thinks would make him be made fun of. So it's, 
there's a long way to go. And they live in the same house. And I mean, they, they totally love each other and respect each other, but they do things totally differently. But I think if more of us classroom teachers can be more open and start using learn to use that's what i why i'm here try to learn to use better um more open ways of teaching and not just looking saying boy girl and couldn't you even um i'm a music teacher but couldn't you like have this unicorn be um non-colored and then everyone gets to pick it their own color right actually <laughs> Nancy, um, do you want to just do this training? Because if you go to the link that I provide for the original source of the gender unicorn, there's a coloring page. That's it. There's all of these other things. And um, I worked with a music teacher who was like, one of the things I like to do is um, uh, in different verses of a song, I'll change the pronouns so that we're all hearing ourselves in a song. Like, There's lots of things that we can and should be doing. Um, and I also wanted to flag Pug Dog. Love that book. It's out of print, so you have to find it usually from a library or something like that. But that's a great one. Um, again, I would say for all ages, but most, but Push is younger for sure. Um, and the other thing I wanted to pull out of what you were saying, Nancy, is that um, a concrete, ex real example of how um, gender and sexuality are conflated. So if we look at the history of trans people being policed and experiencing violence, um, institutionally arrested, um, beat up by cops, um, accused of starting riots when they're defending, um, when people are defending themselves, um, the laws targeted gender. They targeted gender, um, and conflated it with sexuality. So, um, so trans people bore the brunt in a lot of um, ways in terms of police um, going and beating up um, like gay people in bars, right? And because, you know, they, it's a little bit, not that police didn't go into people's homes and try to, um, enforce like anti-sodomy laws and things like that. But if they went into a bar, they were pulling out laws that said, you can't be wearing more than two pieces of the other gender's clothing. And so those are real ways that it's conflated, both in terms of like our experiences when um, there are people who say like, you know, I don't want my kid to look gay. But what they're saying is, I don't want my kid to um, express their gender in a like, in a broader way, right? So that's happening all the time. And so how do we expand that, like thinking, how do we expand our language so that we can actually talk about what we're talking about? Um, before we get there, I want to, we're gonna do that together a little bit, but I wanna give you some um, sort of concrete tools to um, spread the why this is important. So I have this, um, mental math exercise, which actually in your workbook, it doesn't have to be mental, you can um, write things out. But um, I pulled out a couple um, statistics from some uh, reviewed studies and, um, and I have this word problem for you. Um, if 3% of Minnesota teens identify as transgender in 2018, and if Massachusetts has statistically similar demographics, so we'll just take that mental leap here, and if 46% of LGBT people do not come out, how many trans students have you taught? If you go to your workbook and pull up um, the mental math exercise there, um, it's asking you to estimate the number of students you've taught, which is kind of like the hardest part. So you could take a wild guess. Um, and once you do that, you can find 3% of that or multiply that number by 0 0.03. Um, and then you can double that number, multiply it by two. The reason being that if 3% of our students come out as teens, as transgender, but we know roughly half do not come out. This gives us an estimate of how many of our students 
um, might identify as transgender as teens. This is like a wildly low estimate. We know that people, gender identities change or their ability to communicate about it um, changes over the course of our lifetime. So this would be a low estimate. Um, but see what you can come up with because I'm going to start a poll here to see um, approximately how many students we've taught that are trans or oftentimes transgender is used as an umbrella to also identify non-binary people and many other gender identities. Um, but let's see how many students collectively we have taught. Also, as a side note, Dan, will you help me remember to save the chat? Absolutely. <laughs> so let's see. Got some numbers coming in here. We've got two people so far who estimate over 61 students. And interestingly, zero people with 41 to 50, although other, all other ranges are covered. And um, I see a little over half of us have put in our estimate. Um, I'll give us like another minute or so. Maybe 10 seconds. So you could put in a wild guess if you haven't already put in your estimate. Dan, when I end polling, will we all see the results? Yes. Okay. You'll be able to tell them to show it. All right. Let's see where we're at. Um, so, Approximately how many trans and non-binary students have we taught? Um, you can see there's a huge range. Um, we have a huge range of how many students we've taught, and so that makes sense. Um, but doing this mental math exercise at the very least um, shows that we've all taught trans students, whether we knew they were um, identifying that way, whether they were identifying that way or not. Um, and so we want to be teaching who our students are, not um, at all points in their life, so they can access our curriculum. Um, if you have any reflections on these numbers um, or are doing that exercise, please feel free to put it in the chat. Nancy. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so. Oh. Do we do? Okay. So I want to shift a little bit to thinking about trauma as um, sort of one of the whys of why we're doing this work. And I know my school um, strives to be a trauma informed um, institution, and I am sure that many of yours have too. Um, and so I want you to start thinking about, and please feel free to discuss in the chat, how does a student's gender identity correlate with experiences of trauma? Um, I want to be clear that I'm not advocating that we talk about this in terms of someone's gender identity causing them trauma. I feel clear that it's the world that causes this trauma, um, that it's our, um, our policies, our institutions that um, encourage this trauma, but that trauma is real nonetheless. Um, so, um, this is, oh, I gotta open a bigger, sorry, I can't see it. Let me pull this up for us all. Uh, ooh, and we gotta move through things. So yeah, if you wanna make um, some connections in the chat, please, feel free to do so, but um, the graphic, oh, yes, uh, 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 um, 
it is in the, you have the, sorry, um, in the workbook, there's a link to the slides and the graphic is linked in there. I think like that's the best I can do in this moment. Um, sorry for that. But um, trauma contributes to a lot of different um, behaviors, experiences, et cetera, in school that prevent our students from learning. Um, it, the impacts of trauma are learning problems, behavior problems, cognitive delays. Um, they're medical. We see them in terms of like lung health, heart health. Um, we see medical in terms of um, substance use. Um, and that, so the impacts of trauma are real in many different ways and real in the ways we see them in our classrooms. Um, one of the ways that trauma is quantified is by um, an index or indicator called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Indicator or ACEs. And um, these include literally sort of like taking a tally of, um, of various experiences like sexual abuse, the incarceration of a caregiver, um, being in foster care, having a major move or immigration experience. Um, and what we know about um, research that's been done on the health and experiences of trans and non-binary people is that um, trans and non-binary people are more um, statistically more likely than um, most other people in the world um, to experience a lot of these indicators that cause trauma. Um, so there's a lot of ways that in school, one, it sort of makes our, our work harder to, um, to educate our students if they're experiencing trauma. Um, and we have a, the power to change or prevent some of those experiences of trauma, um, particularly around um, emotional neglect um, and emotional abuse that we might not be trying to do, but if our students don't see themselves in our, our curriculum, we're contributing to that instead of taking that away. Um, yeah, physical aggression. And also, um, in terms of the school communities we're creating, are we actually preventing or interrupting or changing a culture that allows for bullying, that allows for physical aggression, that allows for um, emotional abuse um, within our school walls or our virtual walls, I guess. Um, ah, let's move forward. Um, so I'm, um, come on. A couple other quick whys. Um, it's the law in Massachusetts. Um, the current version of the laws um, are, have been around since 2014. If you want to see how it's the law um, and share that with other people, it is a big motivator for lots. Um, and so you can, because this is linked in the slides, that is um, in links in your workbook. Um, and the law is um, active in different ways. The Department of Ed has um, slowly been working on principles that supposedly all schools need to follow in order to make our school communities um, serving of trans and um, non-binary students as well as other LGBTQ students as well. Um, I kind of cherry picked some of uh, the parts of these principles that particularly resonate with me, um, but you can again explore these further. Um, beyond law or beyond why, how do we do this? Um, I think of it in terms of this rainbow. Um, I think of um, the control we have over our classroom context and also the influence we can have on our school culture in these ways. Um, so one, we have to explicitly teach it. Um, and 
there's been lots of great um, movements around how we teach to diversity in lots of different ways of diversity. Um, but I want to push all of our movements um, around inclusion to not teach how to tolerate each other. That's not to say teaching tolerance doesn't have excellent resources. Unfortunately, they have an unfortunate name. I don't want any of my students to feel tolerated. I want them to feel celebrated. Um, and so we do need to be explicitly teaching this. Like um, Jen earlier was saying, um, how do I use this unicorn with my kindergartners? Yes, we need to be explicitly teaching it. We also need to be weeding. Um, and this is a library term that some of you may be familiar with, but I find it to be really useful. Um, there's oftentimes there's books on our shelves and you can use the shelf metaphorically in any way that you want that are damaged and so people won't pick them up and use them that um, spread misinformation and so they um, serve as a detriment to anyone's learning. There's lots of different ways why we would weed things. And that's hard because some of our favorite things might have something in there that really um, make our students feel excluded. Um, and so how do we find something better? How do we explicitly teach that parts of what we're using are not okay? We've got to do it. It's hard. We've got to let go sometimes. Weeding is important. Um, embedding in our curriculum when it's not when we're not explicitly teaching but having it just be part of everything that we do um, even when we're not explicitly talking about it is also really important and they like to use dolly parton as an example of this if any of you are in elementary or middle school um, education you might be familiar with the who is and who was biography series with the bobbleheads on the front of them if you read the biography of Dolly Parton from that series, which I did right before seeing Dolly Parton at Tinglewood some years ago, um, you will see that there is a paragraph in there just talking about Dolly, Dolly Parton and her fans where it has a sentence, sentence or two referencing how um, Dolly Parton's fans include a lot of LGBT community members and how she has been supportive of the LGBT community um, in a public way. And it's not what the book is about, but it is embedded in there because we can't talk about people if we're not talking about um, LGBT people and trans people. And so it's, that's a way that I think about how are we embedding things. Um, we also have to lean in and welcome questions even when they're hard. And usually they will be hard. So when, um, Jen, you were bringing up great examples of hard questions, and Nancy also. Um, and I hate the word tolerate, um, but um, so I have here don't tolerate. And so don't tolerate when our students are saying, you can't wear a unicorn because you're a boy. Instead, we need to be having, we need to lean in, we need to, um, create the context where all of us are learning from our mistakes, including ourselves and our students. And that goes um, when we have um, a kindergartner saying you can't wear a tutu or um, when you have a 15 year old saying, you're saying this is women's history, but how do I know this person identified as a woman? Um, I think that the don't tolerate mean in those things um, go together very strongly, particularly in the second example, where um, if the, the question is a good question, but what is the intent? And we need to deal with both of those things. Um, and we need to expand everything that we're doing to model inclusion. Um, so, I'm going to give you a couple concrete things here, um, and I would love to have, I'm sure the conversation in the chat is going great. Um, sorry, Jennifer, you have to leave too. Um, but think about what this rainbow, what are you doing right now, or what do you want to do? And let's give each other even more ideas than what I put up on the screen. Um, and keep the conversation going on the chat. Oh my gosh, everything I learn about Dolly Parton, I love. Thanks, everyone. Um, 
So actually, I'll come back to that. So um, another way of sort of saying expand and also embed is that um, we can do this work visually in the visuals we're using with our students textually right in terms of the literature we're using um, and also numerically like what are our math problems saying and who are they about right like there's a lot of different ways we need to be embedding and expanding what we're doing and um, right like I said before directly and how we're explicitly teaching indirectly and who is included in our projects that aren't directly about gender um, and we got to do it always. So some recommendations I have are open positive communication with the school community, including families, which has come up, thank you, about gender and sexuality diversity, including, include celebrating gender and sexuality diversity, not just tolerating it in social emotional learning. Um, and that's a place that I am constantly shocked at how social emotional learning curriculum do not talk about how culture influences all of these ideas and culture comes out of um, our experiences of gender culture or they're related um, comes out our, of our experiences of race and ethnicity and if we're not focusing on our social emotional learning on celebrating um, our diversity i don't know what we're doing um, we need common affirming school language that is modeled by staff when talking to and about LGBTQI asterisk school community members and our needs. We need direct and respectful staff communication that maintains privacy about the LGBTQI asterisk identities of our community members. There's some things I'm, I recommend that we stop or that we interrupt or that we don't do. Um, don't explicitly and don't implicitly give your students two choices for identifying their gender um, by saying things like boys and girls, let's all line up. Implicitly there, we're saying you have two options. Um, or if we say boys line up here and girls line up there. Um, there's lots of different ways that it's hard to change the language we're used to. Um, and Recently, I got a dog and I found myself falling into this thing of always referring to her as like in some girl way. And I was like, why am I doing that? I don't think she cares about gender. So how can I change this thing that I didn't even know was going to come out until I got a dog, right? So with students, my preferred thing is friends. Um, other people do scholars. Other people say students. There's a lot of different ways that we can make sure implicitly our language is including our students instead of excluding our students when we're not intending to exclude them. Um, I suggest that you don't use mom and dad when you talk to your students about the adults they live with. Um, I think that that um, isn't reflective of the genders of our families as well as the structures of our families too. Um, and don't encourage students to take on stereotypical gendered roles, which lots will, but um, what do our coloring sheets show? Um, Grownups, that's a good one. Might not be the best one for like high school, but I like it um, <laughs> in elementary school. Um, so how do we, how do we provide um, an expanded options rather than ingraining stereotypical roles that will just give our students power to hurt each other and etc. Um, some other recommendations I have switch pronouns and names for students when they request it. Um, that can be really hard. We can make mistakes. I really personally am a per uh, I really personally am a person um, who struggles with making mistakes and not getting things right the first time. Um, and this is really hard for me and I have to practice and it, in the end, you don't even remember when it was different. Um, we need to empower students to express their gender and sexuality through clothing, hairstyle, accessories, and the schoolwork that they produce. We need to normalize the knowledge of where to find um, and 
normalize the using of bathrooms that serve people of any gender identity. So ideally, all of our bathrooms, for many, many, many reasons, would be single use. Um, but that is not the case in all of our um, institutions, if we ever are in them again. Um, but the bathrooms that are for, um, that, I mean, I think all bathrooms should be designated for all genders, but if that's not the case, if it's that some are, we need to normalize that use and not just for the kids who identify as trans or non-binary. Um, and so we can be part of modeling that. Um, we need to include LGBTQI asterisk people, leaders, artists, scientists, etc., through story problems, writing prompts, readings, art, music in our lessons and our curriculum. We need to evaluate and weed bias and heteronormativity from lesson plans and curriculum. Um, so, oh, I just like ran through that. And so we have a couple minutes, but I would like you to think about, I think that focusing on language um, is a way to see where you, where I individually, we need to go next to further our learning. So if weeding was something that you were like, huh, I need to think about um, how I can go about doing this in my own classroom. Or if, um, non-binary is a word that you really need to take more time with. I will take a moment for a personal story here. Um, non-binary to me is fairly new language that really came um, into my purview, let's say like, I'm bad at time, let's say five years ago. Um, and when I first started hearing non-binary, to me it really reflected an academic space and I feel very resistant to like academic spaces as like the place where things come out of. Um, and I, I didn't want to embrace the term. I didn't want to. Um, but I, you know, I tried to have conversations with myself and other people that explored why am I so resistant to this? And unfortunately it took people who the word really reflected how they feel, how they know themselves to be, their identities, um, to convince me that I shouldn't be such a jerk about a word that doesn't hurt me at all. Um, so I think that this engagement with language and the changing of language can really show us some places to go. Um, it looks like there's some good questions coming up in the chat. Um, and some thoughts. I do encourage you with our next three minutes to take a look at the language tool another time and identify what are your next steps. Um, what are three words that are pushing you forward? Um, ooh, I'm gonna call some people out here. Anna saying three words that will launch my next steps. Audit my literature. Mm, nice. Um, What is launching your next steps? I also um, wanted to note that some of the points I'm making around do's and don'ts, I pulled out of a tool that I developed um, in by referencing a lot of great tool auditing tools around thinking about um, where you currently are in your classroom or school community and where your school community is in terms of um, including in this audit tool, I focus in a larger sense on LGBTQI asterisks um, communities. Um, but it can, it might give you some more concrete ways to self-evaluate and um, move forward. And that's in the resources list. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Deborah is saying things in a much more eloquent way than I managed to. When I found out non-binary is empowering, I began to embrace it. That's exactly what happened to me too. And I, I honestly feel like a jerk that I couldn't just accept that from go, you know? Um, if you have any um, questions or thoughts or um, that you want to connect around, I am excited to hear from you. I'm really excited to see some of these answers to our next steps. Um, and please continue to think about them and share them.